Good evening. We're going to uh, begin the, uh, the hearing on City Council Bill 12-0152. Um, I ask, request all my colleagues on the committee, could you please be seated so we can, so we can begin? Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Clark. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. She knows. Okay. Um, good evening, colleagues and members of the audience. My name is Ed Reisinger. I'm the chairman of the Land Use and Trans Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. I also represent the uh, 10th Council Matic District. Uh, we are here this evening to conduct the seven of eight public hearings in the community on City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning. Today's hearing will address Title 11, the industrial districts. This comprehensive zoning code rewrite is a very important time to learn about the general public's land use and zoning priorities. We want to hear from as many of our constituents as possible. We would like to thank the administrative team and the entire Ben Franklin at Masonville Co. family for hosting us this evening. I know we are joined by Chris Pataglia, the principal of the school. Thank you very much. Thank you for signing Bernbaum, the assistant principal. Okay, you were right there, I got it. Um, Every hearing is open to public testimony and citizens may come and provide testimony at each public hearing. The following guidelines, however, will be enforced today and throughout this process. Persons wishing to offer all testimony must sign in and state their name, their address or community in which they reside and who, if anyone, they represent for the record. Um, individuals offering testimony will be limited to a three to a, a three minutes presentation. The screen behind me will assist you with keeping track of your time. If multiple people from any organization or affiliated group are present, one representative should be de designated to speak on behalf of that organization or group. Individuals may not sign in to testify and then yield their time to another person. As stated previously, all ind individuals, individuals will be printed permitted to testify only once. If the individual has points they wish to raise that cannot be addressed in the allotted three minute time period, they can submit written testimony to committee staff at the hearing. If you would like to attend a hearing to testify about a part of the zoning code ordinance other than the sections the committee intends to study during this hearing, you may do so and your testimony will be taken during the hearing. If you wish to provide written testimony, please mail it to the Office of Council Biotic Services, attention to Antoine Banks at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland 21202, or send email at antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov, which should be on the screen. Um, one of my ground rules is uh, a request to please turn off your cell phones, um, androids, um, whatever, to give respect and courtesy to those who are going to testify. Um, the planning department will provide us with the report, which includes a PowerPoint presentation. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to uh, let, let the agencies give their presentation, and then we're going to hear from the audience and then after that, then my colleagues on the committee will be asking questions. Um, I also want to mention that Simon Bonebound, who is the assistant principal, is back there. I apologize if I destroyed your name. <laughs> we are also joined by Angela Gibson from the mayor's office, Kara Kuntz, who is here representing uh, President Jack Young and also Aaron Rowe is here tonight representing President uh, um, Jack Young. Also, Michelle Worsberger representing um, President Jack Young and also Nick Blendy who is here representing uh, Mayor Stephanie Rollins-Blake. 
Okay. To my far left are my colleagues and, and committee members is Sharon Green Middleton. To my left, to her right, is uh, Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To my immediate left is Councilman uh, Jim Kraft, who is the vice chair of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To my far right is Councilman Bob Curran. To his left is the Dean of the Council, Councilwoman Ricky Spector. We also join to my immediate right is the staff person of the committee, uh, Mr. Antoine Banks. Um, and entering the uh, facility is the president of the uh, city council, Bernard Jack Young. And at this time, uh, we will have the presentation from the uh, planning department. And anyone who wishes to sign in to testify, make sure you sign this sheet. Thank you. Jill. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, honorable council members. My name is Jill Lemke. I am, among other things, uh, an economic development planner and industrial community planner for the Department of Planning, which is why I'm giving the presentation tonight. Um, just to give a little bit of background for those who have not been at previous hearings, zoning is a regulation that is placed on land and determines what can be put on that land uh, size and uh, types of buildings and uses that are allowed on that land. The purpose of zoning is to protect the health and welfare of the citizens. Um, the first zoning code in Baltimore was in 1923 and our current code was passed in 1971. Zoning is a regulation that's passed by law by the city council um, and allows for the districts to be applied in both text and a map. Um, what zoning cannot what zoning cannot do is determine between what is a good business and a bad business. Um, zoning cannot control human behavior. It simply determines what types of uses um, can be allowed on certain parcels of land. Um, Again, the zoning code was last updated in 1971. Um, at that time, the common wisdom was that we were moving more towards a suburban model of uh, development, which separated all uses and was more oriented towards cars and less oriented towards pedestrians um, than cities had been previously. As we know now, that is not the best way to plan for a city or an urban area like Baltimore. Um, so we'd like to modernize the code. Um, that was a goal, a major goal of the comprehensive plan, live, earn, play, learn, that was passed by the Planning Commission and approved by City Council. Um, that support, that called for a more modern zoning code that allows for development um, while protecting neighborhood character and promoting job growth. Uh, a goal of transform is to create a zoning code that is more predictable, understandable, and enforceable. While we were drafting the code, we used these eight principles. I'm not going to read through them all. Um, they reiterate a lot of the goals um, that I mentioned and include implementing the comprehensive master plan. So the code is organized by titles. Tonight we're here again to discuss Title 11 for industrial districts. Um, each title includes a description of the districts, um, what uses are permitted, bulk and yard standards, design standards, and cross-references to other parts of the code that would apply. In the industrial title, uh, there are three new industrial categories or districts that are defined. Bioscience Campus District is intended to be um, a district that allows a mix of research and development associated with the biosciences and right now have been mapped mainly to EBDI and the University of Maryland Bio Campus. Um, industrial mixed use is an industrial mixed use district. The only um, bioscience and industrial mixed use are the only ones that permit residential. Um, industrial mixed use is intended to allow for the redevelopment and reuse of old multi story industrial buildings that are uh, immediately adjacent to um, 
residential uses and may buffer the community from more heavier, heavy industrial uses. Um, again, it is intended for the redevelopment and reuse of industrial style buildings like the copycat building, which is pictured here. The office industrial campus is a district that would allow more suburban office industrial mix um, in a campus-like environment. One example would be the Chesapeake Commerce Center. Um, it's a uh, mixed-use district in that it allows light industry and some office and re limited retail uses. Light industrial is um, what you would think of as a buffer district. Um, one of the things that Transform does is simplify the zoning code. In Title 11, that means we have gone from Three, dis three main districts, M1, M2, and M3, to two main districts. Industrial one would be light industrial, and industrial two would be general industrial. The main difference is light industrial is any industrial use that can be accommodated within a building that does not include high intensity uses that are outdoors. Um, so no smokestack, no um, piles of materials or outdoor processing that would have a negative impact on surrounding uses. Um, an example of that would be a box factory. If you um, have ever been to a box factory, it's a industrial building that you cannot tell from the outside what they're making on the inside. And that's what light industry is intended to be. General industry is what you would think of as heavy industry. Currently encompasses most uses that are included in M2 and M3 and includes um, distribution and warehousing type uses as well as manufacturing. Um, Maritime Industrial, or the MI District, is a um, change to the current uh, zoning code in that it turns the, the MIZOD, the Maritime Industrial Zoning Overlay District, to an underlying district instead of an overlay district. Um, in addition, we've um, added some requirements to the process of rezoning um, that would protect the maritime uses in the same way that the MISOD currently protects those uses that include deep water access that support the port of Baltimore. Uh, this is what the use table looks like. It's impossible to read, but it includes a list of uses um, and whether or not they're permitted or conditional. Um, it includes industrial, commercial, and ins limited institutional and limited commercial uses. And um, as I said, makes reference to design standards and standards of use that are in other parts of the code, mainly in Title 14. Um, it also includes a table that lists all of the bulk and um, setback requirements and references design standards in uh, Title, uh, for Title 11, um, including maximum building height, minimum lot areas, um, side yard distances, buffer requirements. Um, just to review some of the other changes in industrial districts, um, planned unit developments will be limited to OIC, the bioscience, office industrial campus, and industrial mixed use, and will not be permitted in any of the districts that are I-1, I-2, or maritime industrial. The purpose of that is to protect industrial land for industrial uses that create jobs and prevent the de facto rezoning of those areas through the use of a planned unit development. Um, in addition, uh, new junkyards, incinerators, nuclear power plants, solid waste landfills are prohibited in the new code. And even though existing junkyards and scrapyards still exist, um, they will be grandfathered in and, accord and will be subject to the rules of conditional uses or non-conforming uses. Um, again, special considerations have been added for rezonings within the MIZOD or the Maritime Industrial District. Um, these rezonings from any of the MI districts to any other use will require a higher standard. They'll have to meet the standards of the state's uh, enabling legislation, as well as the requirements that are listed in the bill itself. 
um, and many of those include all of the requirements that are in the current MISOD as well as a 30-day review period where the Planning Commission would have to get uh, an opinion, a written opinion from both the Maryland Port Administration and adjacent owners. Um, while the Planning Commission reviewed section or Title 11, um, they recommended the following adding commercial or vocational educational facilities to I2 and MI districts to allow for vocational training within the industrial area to make it easier for that type of training and to give more um, access to uh, job producers. Um, Planning Commission recommended clarifying that office uses may only be um, allowed as accessory uses in I1, I2, and the Maritime Industrial District. Um, they recommend making government offices permitted in industrial mixed-use districts and making banquet halls conditional in the industrial mixed-use district. Um, again, all of the non-conforming uses that would be made non-conforming by the new legislation would be subject to the rules of non-conforming uses, non-conforming structures, non-conforming lots of records, and non-conforming signs as in any of the other um, districts. And that is the end of our presentation. Okay, at this time we have uh, Councilman Kern, you have a question? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for deferring me because I have to be back uptown. It's uh, first time down here to Mason Cove. <laughs> so, so, uh, hope I can find my way home, but uh, lo lovely auditorium and school you have here. Um, and I do have time to say, that's why I appreciate you allowing me. Light industrial. The question I have is, obviously, you may be aware that I have two manufacturers in my district. Yes. Zeke's Coffee, mm -hmm. because they roast the, the beans, and Walk and Fuss Candy, yes. because they manufacture the candy. I found a home off of Blair Road up to Hartford Road, but because it's a B zone, I had to do some creative zoning with my late friend Donald Small to allow them to be there. And I could ill afford to have either one of those two uh, facilities go to the county. Does the light industrial districts allow them to be there? And if there were amendments that remove the light industrial district or massage anyway, can they still be grandfathered in because they're there now? Um, we've actually addressed those types of uses in two ways. Yes, they will be allowed in any I-1 district. Right. Um, in addition, we've um, made them allowable or conditional in um, some of the C districts, um, and they are classified as food processing light, right. um, which would be light industrial in a commercial environment with uh, some type of retail <clears throat> component, with which both Zeke's and Walk and Fuss would okay. um, qualify. And under. one other question, Mr. Chairman, about the, you mentioned about the Mizod, it's a underlying district versus an overlay district. Under, over, what is, give me the distinction of an underlying mm -hmm. to overlay district. The current MISOD is an overlay district that expires in 2024. Um, it sits on top of the underlying zoning, which is currently M3. That causes some confusion and causes <clears throat> some angst amongst industrial users and their financers who want to see a more permanent district. And this would be a more permanent this district? This would be a permanent district until the zoning code is re re redone, redone. again. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that in MI district um, a property cannot be rezoned, but it would have to um, it would have to fall under those more strict requirements for rezoning. So okay. it's actually stricter than the current MISOD. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to say that because I'm going to head up back to the northeast. Um, law department, thank you, Jill. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I'm Vic Turvola from the law department. The law department had no specific comments on this particular article. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to your questions. Uh, DPW? Nothing? Okay. Any other agencies? Health department? No? Um, at this time, we're going to go on public testimony, and we'll start with uh, 
Eilish Terzi. Did I pronounce that right? Okay, okay. Uh, my name is Elias Terzi. I own the property 200 South Franklin Town Road. Uh, it's 2.7 acre, heavy industrial M22 zone. Uh, when I purchased the property, the only reason I purchased it, the only reason, because it was heavy industrial. I would not even take it if somebody gave it to me who is not heavy industrial. And we were in the transaction to somebody potentially purchase the property. Somehow, he asked for the zoning department, the uh, ONR. When I find out, Miss Kate Edwards, she said that the potential purchaser asked for it. Uh, it's, it kind of was too late when I find out. Was the instead the um, um, IMU. And uh, so, therefore, they recommend me to come and speak here. And also, I spoke to Mr. Flickinger. Fred Flickinger Planning, yes. yes. Um, this, this property also former pain factory, a lasting pain for being there about 40 years or 60 years, I don't know. Uh, I'm reading his email. Uh, Mr. Selma Terzi, who owned this property, spoke uh, with uh, Kate Edwards and then uh, with Councilman uh, Mr. Welch about the recommending zone transform. Property just, uh, just to the south are proposed on R and the, the north as IMU. At the time of our analysis, analysis, the information I had was that the youth center program was a, buying the property. Mr. Terzi informed, uh, informed us that the uh, foreclosed on the uh, prospective buyer. I'm sorry, I'm foreigner, so. No, go ahead, take, take your time. Uh, and because uh, this is a former paint factory, the ONR will not be workable. I agree with, uh, with him that IMU is appropriate. Uh, 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 Mr. Welch has concurred, and I have his, e uh, okay, his email. Yeah, we we'll just leave it here. Okay. What we'll, we'll distribute it here? Do you do you do you currently own this property? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. What what I recommend is that um, have you talked to Councilman Wells? Yes, I have. He doesn't see any problem to getting IMU. Okay. And your and your issue basically is you want to. I want to yeah. keep it. Yes, industrial. It, okay. So is there I, an issue with this? I said you should be okay there. I appreciate that, sir. And we appreciate you coming out to testify. Thank you, sir. If you, yeah. Um, I would, if I were you, I'd stay in touch with uh, Councilman Wells. And if you have any, any concerns or issues, call, talk to uh, Antoine Banks, our staff person, and we'll, we'll or, work with uh, you. Or Kara? You're, okay. okay. She, she helped me a lot on the process. Okay. She said, right. she She's, made me comfortable calm. <laughs> so I was yeah. going crazy. <laughs> she, she, she makes us all feel comfortable. I appreciate yeah. that. I mean, yeah. you, you, you don't understand. I lost sleep because, you know, the, the property on our at that location, yeah. it will be absolutely worthless. I mean, it's, I wouldn't even want to own it. Yeah. I mean. I, under, I understand. We understand. I pre appreciate that. Yeah. Like and we're going to work with you and help you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Scott Robinson. Hi, my name's Scott Robinson. Can you lift that up too? Yeah, sorry. I guess I'm a little bit taller than most people. Yeah. Um, my name's Scott Robinson. I'm here representing the EFS Industry Members Association out of Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, the EFS Industry Members Association also known as EMA, is a national nonprofit technical trade association comprised of manufacturers, suppliers, distributors, and applicators involved in the exterior installation and finished system industry. Over the last decade, the industry and its system have continued to gain stature with the successful testing that EFS has gone through and the sterling results it has achieved. Um, my comments right now are based on uh, pages 173 and, or 171 and 173 as pertaining to uh, permitted building materials and non-permitted building materials. Um, and before the association 
object to all of Title 11 in this section, we would just request before any vote is taken. In terms of exterior installation and finish system, it referenced panels. And we're just a little bit unclear on what that refers to because that reference isn't everywhere when EVES is mentioned. Um, now, assuming this term greatly does preclude the use of EFs in all new construction under Title 11, we would object to the language. I would note that stucco is listed as a preferred building material. And for a variety of reasons, EFs is equal, if not superior, to stucco in our opinion. Um, in recent studies conducted by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, EFs has proven to surpass stucco. Yeah, can you, can you, you have to slow down a little bit. I'm sorry. So we could comprehend yeah, we, and hear what you're saying. Go ahead. <laughs> I got it, but just kind of slow down a little bit. I don't understand. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Can I just, can you qualify what you were, you were talking about panels and then going to stucco? Okay. I understand. Oh. He's for the panels. This must be a building material. Right. EFs is, it's a building material. on page 172, it's listed as one of the prohibited uses. So in the question that we're wondering right off the bat is after exterior installation and finish system, it says panels. And we're just wondering, we're just looking for clarity on what panels is because going in other references to EFs, panels is not always referenced. So in asking around in terms of the manufacturers that we represent, no one was quite clear on what that is because it's not something referenced in codes or standards. And okay, can Prater give us a definition, quick definition? We don't need a summary, just with, with Definition. EIFS. EIFS. Uh, in the design standards in some of the limited districts, not in all of the industrial districts, it's only in the new campus, uh, we recommended prohibiting the, the prefabricated, I call them IFAS, but he says EFS panels, um, and because that's the sort of um, it's a building material that's not as durable or as attractive as some of the others, with all due respect, he's the manufacturer, but um, it's also a material where we've seen a lot of, um, uh, if it's at the ground level, it, it gets scuffed up more easily. It's not as durable as some of the other materials. So that was the recommendation in the design standards. And if I understand correctly, he would like it to not, to be a permitted material throughout as opposed to um, prohibited in the OIC. It's only prohibited in one of the districts. It's not prohibited in all of them. Okay, we, we, we can deal with that at the work session. We're going to have work sessions. I just want to, I wanted clarity on what that meant. So, who, Councilman Clark? Mr. Chair, just so I understand. You need to. I know you have me unplugged uh, for safety's sake. I, I just want to make sure, Mr. Robinson, that um, I understand which, I, I'm looking at 172 and I'm looking at exterior insulating finish system panels. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, I see. That's why you keep saying EIFS. Thank you. And that is, that's being prohibited in um, uh, OIC and BSC. And, and you, you, and you're, and it's not being prohibited in any place else? Not in the other industrial districts. There are some limitations in the commercial and residential. And so you, you, you represent them and uh, we you want represent, them. We represent the four largest manufacturers of EFs in the United okay. States in addition to suppliers, distributors, other individuals within the industry. And you are you want it not to be prohibited. Right. Okay. Okay. Can and can we see someday what it looks like not today? Sure. I'll I'll gladly send out videos and if you videos if if you can we welcome you to the work work session to help us. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> if you could just bring along like a a panel or something. <laughs> Because I don't know what it looks sure. like. No, absolutely. To, I know what a panel is, but I don't know what. To to just uh, piggyback on my colleague, uh, Councilwoman Clark, do you have any addresses where this 
the, this trip. I could this, send you some. We have members in Baltimore. Yeah, I'd that like to have see. Put up I just maybe if you gave us some addresses, sure. we could eyeball it. Sure. No, okay. absolutely. I know there's a form stone issue now and all those kind of things. I'd like to see what the skin looks mm -hmm. like on a building. Yeah, me too. Okay. You have any, is that no, it? I mean, that's. Uh, we certainly are willing to work with each of you. I mean, uh, as this process moves forward, so I certainly don't want to take any more of your time. No, right we, we welcome, give the information to Antoine Bank so sure. we can send you uh, the dates and time sure. we have. Sure, okay? sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Robinson. You, sir. You might have to take a bus ride, Mr. Chair. Yeah. yeah, well, wait till we get to the Formstone discussion. Yeah. James Archibald. They took it out. I know they did, but I'm still not Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Reisinger, uh, City Council, President uh, Young, members of the Council and staff. Uh, my name is uh, James Archibald. Uh, in my day job, I'm with senior management with STX Lacrosse uh, and the parent company, William T. Burnett. And I will say that Councilman Reisinger has been a tremendous supporter of ours in the Carroll Camden uh, business community over the years. It's been tremendous help uh, to us. But I'm here tonight in my personal capacity uh, as the owner with my wife of uh, a single family residence property known as 1527 Bush Street. Uh, it's in the center of a block, the north side block of Bush Street between Wicomico in Hamburg streets, uh, and uh, it says to those uh, 15 residences in that block uh, that I direct my remarks, uh, they are located in what is currently an M2 district and would be an I2 <coughs> district under the new, new code. Uh, the 15 houses uh, are well maintained with one exception, uh, the center house was in very poor shape externally uh, and internally, and my wife and I figured the best way to solve that problem was to buy it, uh, which we've done, and get it up to where the rest of the houses in that uh, block are. And there's been a lot of, of work and uh, renovation into that. Just to give a quick sense, uh, the values now of some of those properties, which originally were what you can imagine, uh, one sold, according to the SDAT records, uh, for 171,000 uh, in 2010. Another uh, sold for 218,000. So there's been substantial private investment in that block, uh, and we're looking forward to contributing to it. STX has been growing along the other side of that block. As the councilman knows, we've had a great expansion. Uh, he's helped with that, and we've put offices in what used to be warehouse space along that. Right down the street is the AFSME office building and so on. Uh, as, uh, as I understand it, the current draft uh, of the ordinance would continue the non-conforming <coughs> status uh, for those 15 uh, properties, uh, designating them as I-2. Have talked uh, with uh, city planner Brett Fleckinger about it uh, with uh, Leon Pickett at the uh, BDC. And I think their sense is, and obviously you'd want to explore it with them, that switching that block, those the properties, that land to an IMU, an industrial mixed use, would take it out of its non-conforming status and, and I think be beneficial to the city and, and to the property owners and consistent uh, with the uh, goals of the new ordinance. Okay. Thank you very much for your consideration. Hey, we'll work that out. I've got some written copies. Yeah, please. Yeah. He wants IMU. That's all. That's all. And I think it's, it's right now. It's Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rupert, Danny. He wants IMU, industrial mixed use. Because he's a house? Um, good evening. Um, good my evening. name is Rupert Denny, and I'm the general manager of C. Steinweg in Baltimore and past chairman of the Baltimore Port Alliance. And I'm speaking on behalf of Steinweg, who I work for, and also for a segment of the Baltimore Port Alliance um, here in Baltimore. 
Uh, Steinweg Worldwide is a logistics provider specializing in the transportation, storage, and handling of non-ferrous metals and soft commodities such as cocoa and coffee. We have about 3,700 employees <coughs> in 21 countries worldwide. Steinweg has been located at the Port of Baltimore for 24 years and owns a marine terminal in Locust Point and just under 1 million square feet of warehouse space in four locations. I'd like to make two points, if I may. One, that major industrial investment <coughs> come from out of state and out of the country. Steinweg is a Dutch company, and as a recent example, Amazon is based in Seattle. Companies such as ours need to be <coughs> reassured that our investments will be protected for the long term. For Steinweg, the proposed M1 zone and its predecessor, the Mizod, has given us and other private marine terminal operators in the Port of Baltimore some level of comfort that Baltimore was serious about attracting investment. My second point is that industrial investment is vital. Consider that in 2012 it was reported, and I think it was by the Brookings Institution, that only 25% of city residents hold a college degree. The city's unemployment rate at 10% was some three points higher than the state average and that some 130,000 people live below the poverty line. <clears throat> right now, one of the few opportunities for our fellow citizens to rise above this demographic is to find meaningful blue-collar work. Maritime-related companies can do this. So in conclusion, the Maritime Industrial Zone will send an important message to the global marketplace that Baltimore wants to support port business. That message will then translate into further investment in Baltimore's economy. Two, the proposed maritime industrial zone is very important because it will support industry that can only operate on, on deep water and it will continue to protect the port, which is a major economic driver for the city and the state. C, three, I beg your pardon, deep water access is limited and maritime assets are irreplaceable. So, Maritime industrial businesses need to be protected and promoted for f future generations. Therefore, we support the proposed <coughs> maritime industrial zone and ask that the committee move the legislation forward expeditiously. I want to thank the committee for holding a hearing focused on industry and recognizing that the maritime industry is an important economic driver in Baltimore. Uh, Councilor Kraft has a question. Thank you. Um, but we are joined by Councilman Warren Branch. Councilman Kraft. <coughs> Rupert, um, okay, so you guys want the M1, the, the new um, MI Maritime Industrial, you're fine with that? Absolutely. Okay. Now, my next question is, we have this I1 Light Industrial and this I2 Gen General Industrial, and I've heard the Light Industrial described as a buffer zone. Um, we've talked many times about a buffer between um, the Mizod and the other zones that are there. Um, but I'm concerned about some of, the, um, some of the descriptions of light industrial uses um, pushing up against the manufacturing. Um, uh, for example, in the description of light industrial uses, um, it says low intensity, non nuisance, light fabrication and assembly type manufacturing, as well as office and R&D facilities with little to no outside impacts. Um, do you think that that is a, a, a good buffer right up against heavy port industrial users? I mean, I think in principle, um, a buffer to us is important in as much that if a community is right up against an industrial area, the industry groups tend to be working 24-7 and make a lot of noise and at weekends. And that obviously causes community concerns and complaint, which is difficult for us to uh, mitigate. Um, a light industrial use next door, even including an office, which is nine to five, probably just weekdays, as long, as long as we can be neighborly under those circumstances without making a lot of noise. So I think a light industrial use is an ideal buffer. Um, what we would prefer to see is something like us making, frankly, a lot of noise at certain times of the day, a warehousing operation next to us, then a light industrial. 
but certain components of light industrial I don't think create a challenge for us. Okay, I just want, as we move forward and we have the work groups, because we have a lot of time here, no one's rushing this through, I really like to talk about, oh no, it'll be this time next year before we're ready to vote on this, so relax, there's plenty of time. <laughs> um, the, um, but I really would like to talk to, uh, more about this because I am concerned about this issue of, I mean, particularly, you know my district, you know yes. the areas that we're talking about along Clinton Street right. and down through there. Um, you know, you put office space or you put R&D right next to, um, you know, um, Maryland Overpack, yep. and you got problems um, because of the noise, because of the dirt, because of the dust. Um, you can't open the windows, you can't, those sorts of things. So I think that there's got to be, I like your idea of warehouses then getting to something else. So. Um, I mean, okay. Councilman, I mean, if we could sort of have heavy in the, the, the industrial zone, whether it's, you know, non-port related industry, but noisy or port related industry, and then a sort of a buffer around that and then light industrial, that would be an ideal world. But I think there's a compromise if necessary. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ricky. Yeah. Councilwoman Inspector. I've been listening to Rupert for 120 years. <laughs> and what I think uh, to my colleagues' query is, as long as it's not residential, there's compatibility. That light industrial gives us the flexibility that we need. There might not, we're, you can't identify enough warehouse to identify that as being the buffer. So the light industrial, I think, gives us the wiggle room that we need. It's really the residential that would not be compatible in terms of trying to create a buffer. I, I think, Councilman, that, uh, you know, I, I tend to sort of um, um, agree with uh, Councilman Kraft a little. I mean, there's a risk of who you end up next door with. It's less so um, from a residential perspective. I mean, a light industrial, for instance, I mean, it could be for a, a public parking garage. I mean, it doesn't have to be a warehouse. Right. I'm the, just the, bringing the this out as an opportunity. Is there when it's, it, that's the flexibility that I was talking about. Yeah. Um, and I know that the, the everybody is mindful of protecting the um, the Mizot itself. Everybody is. It, it, that's really important to all of us. And to us. I think the light the light industrial is just that gives us the flexibility that we need. Well, perhaps um, Councilman Kraft, Councilman Inspector, we you know we could we could ventilate that. I'm not sure. That, that's the work I, session material. Yeah, I have I'm frankly, I haven't. I have. I've been so involved in the M1, to be honest with you, that my head has been in the sand. I think we'd like to revisit what the light industrial is, and then perhaps come back with some constructive Jill, comment. Jill can offer some uh, expansion on that. So we can talk about. Yeah. Work. yeah. Okay. Sort of work. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And anything um, you can do, Councilman, yeah. bring it along. We'd love to hear that. Thank you. Rupert, oh, yes, sir. Uh, I just want to add that we are going to have work sessions. We welcome you to the work session. We have worked very hard on the MyZod for all those years. And to me, the way I look at it right now, unless somebody could change my, my mind and my way of thinking, my mindset, is that if it's working, why fix something that's not broken? So it may be, on, it may be written here, but we'll have the work sessions. Mm -hmm. Um, if we want to go with the buffer, that's up to the committee, that's up to the council to decide on which way we're going to go. But sure. it's, it's been working this way fine right now. So, I mean, that's my, that's my mindset. So. Well, I, I have to congratulate the committee. I mean, MISOD has worked extremely well for us. I mean, Ruckett, who's in Councilman Kraft's constituent, so they've spent an inordinate amount of money on the strength of the MISOD being there. And I think basically that's what we would see if the M1 continues as well, for which we okay. thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Fraley. Good evening, City Council. City Council members. I'm Jeff Fraley. I'm a third generation owner operator of an industrial contracting and metal recycling company here in South Baltimore. Um, my business supports 15 employees. And more importantly, I'm also the chairman of the South Baltimore Business Alliance. In 2004, the South Baltimore Business Alliance was formed 
mainly to protect our industry's right to exist and to protect existing businesses in Curtis Bay from residential encroachment. So uh, we, we wholeheartedly support the MI district and uh, the industrial uh, yeah. sector of the legislation in general. The SBBA's uh, presence here in South Baltimore has been based around preserving maritime and industri maritime industrial land and the safe transportation corridors, which also connect those, those pockets. Um, I can't uh, stress the importance of the transportation routes being protected uh, as much as the zoning code being established. So we, we support the MI district, and uh, you know, I know the questions were directed to Rupert. We also support important or uh, you know, focused buffering. We would love to see it cascade perfectly between heavy operation, warehousing, and then office space. We understand that there is going to be a little bit of a gray area between finding that perfect mix, so we do want to be flexible. However, I do believe that I read somewhere in the legislation that uh, the office space that uh, Councilman Kraft was referring to has to be associated with that operation in that MI zone, so, uh, an, an accessory space. So I think that's the caveat that we're looking for to help strengthen the code. Okay. Jill wants to make that statement. Okay, so we want to give clarity to what, okay. Sure, Jill, Are you finished? Uh, uh, one second. I just want to, I, I want to thank uh, city council members for being so communicative with the SBBA. I was involved in an interview uh, this past week with BDC's uh, consultant to come in and talk about Baltimore City and the future growth of the economy. Uh, three points that I made or two points that I made uh, were the importance of the new zoning code rewrite, the importance of the truck route, and then thirdly, as a, as a caveat to my two points there, was uh, the ability for business to communicate uh, with our legislative leaders, like yourself. So thank you. Do you have a copy of your testimony? Sure. Yeah, I'll pass it on. Jill, you want to give clarity to? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, one of the amendments that was recommended to Planning Commission and approved was to amend that language because it is unclear. Um, in the use table, it is um, noted that office um, and retail uses are only permitted in I-1, I-2, and MI districts if they're accessory to the manufacturing use. Okay. Is that, is that what you're saying? Councilman Kraft. Is that, um, are R&D facilities still allowed in the light industrial district? to check on that I believe so if they're if they're associated with one of the other uses okay I, I don't want to spend a lot I want to hear from yeah. folks so we, we can talk about it the work session that's a fine point that will have to be investigated yeah I, I have a question you have one I have one I have a microphone and a question So what did we just decide there? I'm sorry, I kind of missed it and I wasn't hearing too clearly. Are, are we looking for, uh, is, is Mr. Fairley looking for a office that's associated with a business? Excuse me, what, what did we just talk about there? The, the relationship of an office in an industrial zoned property to the industry. It has to be an accessory use to one of the existing businesses. So, for example, Domino Sugar has gotcha. an office. It has component. to be like a management office and yes. training and all. So that's what you're sa he's, he was saying. Yeah, you gotta, that's what you. Jeff, you got to use the microphone. That's what you say you. That's what he's saying he wants. Correct. I just wanted clarification. So you don't want some freestanding no, office that's a got change. a little retail business right. or something going on? I'm not asking for a change, no. I'm just pointing out you, what was in the list. What's in there, and right. that's nice. Correct. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Peter O'Malley? I, I just... Hmm. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of this Council Committee, and Mr. President. Uh, my name is Peter O'Malley, and I'm here on behalf of Domino Sugar to speak in support of the proposed Maritime Industrial District. Domino Sugar, as you may know, has been located in Baltimore City for over 90 years now, and Domino employs over 600 people in good-paying jobs. 
Over 442 people work directly for the refinery, while another 168 jobs are generated off-site uh, through trucking, terminal operations, cargo handling, tugboats, uh, railroad operations, and harbor pilots. Both Domino Sugar and the Baltimore Industrial Group have been strong supporters of the Maritime Industrial Overlay, Overlay Zoning District and the <coughs> preservation of Mizod properties. As this committee well knows, the Mizod was created to preserve deep water access for port and maritime industrial uses, which need to be protected from other incompatible uses like residential and office. We are very pleased that the proposed maritime industrial zone seeks to avoid future land use conflicts and continues to protect and promote manufacturing in Baltimore. Uh, we, um, I, I know it's been raised in the past why why aren't PUDs allowed in the MI district? And uh, we'd be very much against that because if, if PUDs were to be allowed in the MI district, then it would totally negate the protections that are afforded by this legislation. So I want to thank the committee for its attention to this matter and thank the chairman for doing such a good job in moving this process forward. And I'm here to answer any questions you might have. You're great. No questions. You Thank you, Mr. Give Chairman. us a copy of your testimony. Yes, sir. Mr. O'Malley. Thank you. Um, Jim Dwyer. Got one more up to that. Uh, good evening. My name is Jim Dwyer, and I run the uh, planning department at the Maryland Port Administration. And we uh, manage the uh, six cargo terminals in the Port of Baltimore, the public terminals and the cruise terminal. Us, along with the uh, two dozen or so private terminals, some of which you've heard here this evening, uh, comprise the greater Port of Baltimore. And uh, the MISA that was enacted in 2004 was really a, a, was a uh, a bold move to preserve the traditional city enterprises uh, on the waterfront. And we are uh, in strong support of the Transform Baltimore uh, bill as currently written. The port's been around for over 300 years, providing a wide range of uh, different types of jobs. And uh, what the port needs is deep water access, it needs industrial land to do its business, and then it also needs the uh, truck and rail routes uh, to these, this industrial land. And the MI uh, takes the Mizod from an overlay district to make it a under, uh, one of the permanent underlying uh, zones, and we see this as strengthening the Mizod. Uh, and so we're very uh, pleased to, to hear that. And it adds uh, some consistency and predictability in the whole planning process. Uh, this is very, very important, in particular for the private terminal operators in the port for getting investments and things of that nature. And I will leave behind a copy of our letter in support of the uh, Transform Baltimore that we submitted uh, earlier this year. And I, I just want you to understand that uh, I think I speak for the committee that we're going to do all we can to uh, look out and support the port and those companies that's affiliated with the port. So Thank you very much. We're so glad Council to hear Councilwoman Spector. I always felt that we made one mistake and we couldn't ever do it again with deep water uh, and the Port Covington area when that went to, um, when that was rezoned and we Really, I rue the day that that happened, and it just can't happen again. Thank you. Uh, Joan Floyd. Thank you, Joan Floyd, president of the Remington Neighborhood Alliance. Um, uh, there's a lot of IMU proposed for Remington, and while the description in the text at page 168 says this district is intended to encourage the reuse of older industrial buildings, what we've actually uh, noticed is that the IMU is a district that provi uh, pro um, provides for very dense residential use. The minimum lot area per unit is 300 square feet. This is a very big change in future development patterns. 
uh, with the current interest in building new high-rise apartment buildings, how many developers will adaptively reuse an old warehouse building when they can tear it down instead and build a very dense high-rise apartment building? Uh, this is yet another instance where the proposed text says one thing and the proposed chart tells us something very different. Um, looking at the chart on pages 20 and 21, I want to talk about something else. The title uses the term bulk and yard regulations. The current code has a section for bulk regulations. It says bulk regulations uh, cover five things. Uh, minimum, uh, maximum height, maximum lot coverage, minimum lot area, minimum size of yards, and maximum floor area ratio. And the section on variances in the, new co in the current code tells us very specifically what uh, authority the zoning board has to change those numbers and what authority it does not have. Uh, the proposed new code is very, very different. It uses the terms bulk regulations, bulk standards, and bulk requirements. Uh, where are these terms ex uh, explained or defined? It also uses the term yard regulations. Apparently, yards are no longer supposed to be bulk regulations. Uh, and, the term, and the variant section that's proposed doesn't provide uh, limits on the zoning board's authority. And we see that some things that are currently variances are proposed to become conditional uses. And we know that the, uh, the approval standards legally for those two things are very, very different. Um, this is one of the areas in which the current code um, gives us a degree of clarity and even certainty, while the proposed new code will take that away. Uh, the proposed new code is actually proposing a lot of uncertainty for us in these areas. As we try to make sense of what's going on with this bill, and we struggle to explain it to our residents, the subject I've mentioned tonight, these subjects are actually proving to be very challenging for us. So I wanted to have that opportunity to speak to those. And thank you very much. And I do have copies. OK, thank you. Um, yeah. yep. I'll see it on the written text. Thanks. Oops. Oh, you had two? <laughs> I'm our counsel. There. Yes, we yes. All, we all want to <coughs> Here, Joan. You'll email me. Mine. No. We'll get, Antoine's going to make sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get copies made. I need Thank you, Joan. Um, that is for SCN. That concludes the public testimony. Does any of my colleagues have any questions to any of the agencies of planning, law, public works? That's it for the public testimony. I have. Yeah. Don't forget me. Yeah. Um, is there anyone in the audience who didn't sign up wish to testify? Going once? Going twice? Okay. Uh, at this time, uh, for my colleagues, we'll start with Councilwoman uh, Mary Pat Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, as as uh, we do at each hearing, um, I, I have prepared written amendments that I'm proposing, and I, w I need to summarize them um, out loud so that we all know that they will be considered in the work session copy uh, in the work sessions, which are public, but in which testimony is not taken. In my own district, um, and this is not just about indus industrial at all, um, these are um, amendments within my own district. Um, I'm proposing to delete all the RMU overlay zones in the 14th district, and they are in uh, areas of Hamden, Medfield, and Harwood. Um, in better way and, and other rezoning in the better Waverly area, um, I'm proposing to rezone um, a lot at Old York Road in Montpelier from R5 to open space OS. In the um, in Clifton Park, I'm proposing to rezone the entire former Lake Clifton uh, campus um, from R6 to open space. Chum area, three vacant lots from R6 to o, uh, open space. In Hampton, um, Pleasant Park, Place Park, two different lots from R7 to open space. Remington, the police warrant headquarter building at 242 West 29th to EC1. 
and in Remington, the park at, park at Fox and West, 28th from IMU to um, EC1, and in Waverly, um, a green space along the 600 block of um, 33rd reaching to Venable, um, rezoned from R7 to R1C. Um, just to summarize about uh, the industrial districts, I do have a question into the law department in which I'm asking whether design standards really belong in the law, in a land use law. I think the standards are very admirable, but they are, I, I wonder whether they belong as part of zoning law um, since um, they have to be approved by an agency which is not, which is advisory. And then people basically have to fight out their zoning fights with the zoning administrator, the zoning board, and or the city council. Who, who, how does that fit into, how does putting these standards in this law, land use law, work out in terms of appeals to the zoning board, appeals from the zoning board, appeals from the city council? Are, are these agencies, are, are design standards properly in this place at this time with this code? Not that they're not good standards and maybe there's another venue, advisory, booklet kind of thing, but um, I don't think they belong as part of, a, of the land use. And then finally, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I have amendments to the, to the IMU, the I-1, and the I-2 permitted and conditional uses. Um, generally, my amendments are more restrictive um, especially with regard to the recommended or proposed commercial uses. So just to run down, uh, not to tell you what the changes are, they're more restrictive um, in general, and they apply to um, dwelling, multifamily, residential care facilities, 17 or more, institutional use, homeless shelters, hospitals, body art establishments, banquet halls, broadcasting stations, car washes, these are in industrial districts, carryouts, daycare centers, adult or child, entertainment indoor, entertainment live, heavy, re heavy retail, medical dental clinics, outdoor dining, heliports, oops, I skipped a page, personal service establishments, restaurants, retail goods, no alcohol sales, retail goods with alcohol sales, tavern truck repair, composting commercial, heliport, materials recovery facility, motor vehicle operations facility, passenger terminal, recyclable materials, truck stop, truck terminal, wholesale goods establishments, um, parking lot principal use, parking lot, parking structure, principal use, planned unit development, wireless telecommunications antenna. In all those subjects, I'm recommending, in general, more restrictive um, permitted and conditional uses in the in, in, in M, IMU, the I-1, and the I-2 districts. I didn't go to I-2 or Maritime because I don't have them in my district, and I don't have a dog in the fight, except as a representative as part of council with the citywide. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilwoman Clark. Any other of my colleagues? Um, the next full hearing was City Council Bill 12 0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning, will be held on Thursday. November the 7th at 6.30 p.m. at the John Hopkins University at the, at the uh, Levering Hall. Levering, it's Levering. Levering Hall, Glass Pavilion, Titles 14 and 15. Use standards, site development standards will be the topic during this hearing. Uh, we will be recessing till then. I want to thank all of you for t 
for attending today's land use and transportation committee hearing. And you can say that I have to attend the conference. Okay, here. You're going to miss the hearing that's in my district. I, I, I'm, I, I'm having someone film it. Uh, I have, <laughs> I have um, conference, uh, Maryland Association of Counties uh, conference, and I won't be at that hearing, but everybody that I know is going to be it's filming and taping it. No, 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 it's in, it, it's in Annapolis. Oh, um, can I say that I have extra copies of what I, um, I, I have copies of what I just summarized in writing, if anybody would be so nerdy as to want a copy, um, they're here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, I just want to thank all of you for attending today's Land Use Transportation Committee hearing. Uh, please check beside you to make sure you don't leave and uh, leave behind any personal belongings.